prisoner is definitely something that we could say is vexing to hear. For the word implies bondage, servitude, something we naturally feel opposed to, do we not? Or at least the ego does in context here. There are some powerful images in all of today's text spanning from a broken vessel, waterless pit, to the irony of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem to finally St. Paul's beautiful song of hope and encouragement and rejoicing in Christ's example to be lived into through our lives as children of grace. We are imprisoned to and allow ourselves to be imprisoned, not but not really for the kingdom of God, but for the kingdom of the world. To know the unholy trinity of I am mine, right? It's that old saying diametrically opposed to one another, living for ourselves or living for others. The journey of the Christian is way beyond the steeple and the people, mentality of living into Christ's impact of grace upon our lives. For I am certainly no mercenary, nor am I a chaplain to culture, the worldly culture, and its preservation of a waterless, graceless pit. Can you fathom that for a moment? A dried, empty, cracked earthen tunnel where the sun is shining above, just barely casting its light into that darkened and unstable place. What if that waterless pit in Zechariah's text was referring to the human soul? Beginning with that conditional if. What if our soul, essence of who we are and spirit, was allowed to be consumed with itself over and above? the living restorative waters of God, we would be dead. It's a sad reality in the life of the church that Passion Sunday, Palm Sunday, has become the band-aid solution to getting Christians to once again hear and contemplate what really Good Friday is to teach us about Christ's walk to the cross. But if we cram this intense moment to be shared with the irony of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, how are we to grasp grace, yet alone realize how truly we are in bondage to sin, death, and the devil? It's just a moment in time, not fully or so fully embraced in that waterless pit, broken vessel of our saint sinner selves. Building up the body is a fabulous image spiritually when you think about the anatomy of the Christ follower, also known as the disciple, the Christian. Our heart is the seat of the soul where life began and where the new nature is sown. The new nature in, with, and through Christ. Its growth and maturity are most certainly reliant on the propitiation, sacrifice of the cross of Christ. But what's the most important element here is the final result. This final result through our hands and feet is grace in action and in God's hopefulness for us, our sake. If we don't allow Christ Jesus to truly and truthfully save us, what are we really living for? The world is a place of empty promises. Let's think about that. When we live for ourselves alone, we are walking on our own through a wilderness of our own divisiveness, a veritable prison potential hell on earth. It can feel that way often when we fill that waterless pit with the refuge, the garbage of the world. Trust me, there's a lot out there. 
we pack the world tightly in it, with it. Everything from servitude to the almighty dollar, right? To indulging, engaging in the graceless behavior and constructions of Satan himself. The stuff he dumps into our lives. Part of this is spiritual warfare, as we know. The other part is, as already mentioned, is our own doing. As a pastor, though, commissioned to care for Christ's flock. Hellfire and brimstone preaching and teaching ain't going to shape the disciple at all. It's just not. It's about control. And uh, instead of magnifying the grace of God and its purposes to infuse in our lives, it is teaching fear and intolerance. On the opposite end of the spectrum with the not really progressive grain of thought, all one word, hyphenated. Neither does preaching or teaching that Jesus is a politically correct eunuch, first century prophet, who didn't resurrect, isn't really completely divine, and just gives us grace candy, teach us anything at all about the truth. We can't handle the truth, to echo Jack Nicholson's famous lines, infamous lines, and in, uh, A Few Good Men, right? That's the film, A Few Good Men. I never saw it, though. <laughs> I've only seen snippets. This is human nature and its frailties. We can't deny this, okay? We want to use superglue, however, on our broken aspects of ourselves instead of being faithfully accepting and accountable for a much more beautiful purpose. Being beautiful spiritually is a frame of mind. And coming from Jesus' perspective, it is a beautiful attitude from a restored soul. A deep humility that is born from the death of the ego and its old natured prison bars. Think about Mother Teresa. She was an amazing little nun from India who has witnessed impact of selflessness, selfless service, is something to greatly inspire us still. I forget how many years she's been passed, passed on. Has it been a decade or so or more? Or. But, I mean, she still inspires us, beyond us, uh, in the gospel, through the gospel, through her hands and feet, lived most graciously and humbly for the Lord. We've not been hearing much good in the news lately. You know, well, the media is trying to soften the blow with uh, seeing trivial stuff like how to get Botox, you know, be the main thing on the screen, and then the little ticker table saying tons of people murdered someplace, and yikes, yikes, yikes. And there's just so much turmoil and strife taking place all over the world these days. It's very disturbing, is it not? From a Greek uh, German pilot that the media is currently debating to either be a terrorist or a manic depressive, to political bumbling and rumbling across the nations trying to merely patch peace with divisive intentions. This patchwork either avoids or becomes completely indifferent to the consequences and dire ramifications their actions actually echo to the world. Thinking about that there, you have to wonder how many people who were cheering in Jesus in the Palm Sunday text, throwing their cloaks before his feet, before uh, him riding in, and, and throwing those palm branches down and singing Hosanna, shouting Hosanna and hallelujah. And just a few days later, in this same city, they were cheering on to his murder. They were helping Pilate make a um, dubious decision. You know, well, let's reenact this old custom to free someone. And uh, he washed his hands of it, if we remember. Now, and uh, they cheered on Barabbas, uh, um, a hoodlum, a, cr a criminal, and truly uh, a murderer, uh, a, a zealot murderer. 
let's face it though, the uh, Israelites were oppressed and under a military dictatorship imposed upon by the Romans. They knew they were one kind of prisoner, but didn't allow themselves truly and truthfully to hear about that spiritual bondage and its true saving solution, Jesus. I, for one, am glad that we didn't get a Rambo version of Jesus, for we needed to be saved in a completely different way. I'm not much of a fan of Mel Gibson's version of uh, the Passion. I think it's gratuitously violent, and I think it takes away from really hearing the story. Jesus saved us from spiritual bondage, but indeed left us with an imprint that our spiritual formation, our faith journey, our walk with Christ needed and continues to grapple with pursuing intentionally, willingly, and sacrificially his will. We hear this most beautifully in St. Paul's pastoral voice to his Philippian flock of disciples. Let the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. I am blessed to hear the passion in his voice beginning this tiny snippet of one of his most profound witnesses to Christ's imprint upon his faith journey as a disciple and recipient of grace. One of the very few positive memories I had at the start of my seminary studies was taking a scriptures by heart class and memorizing, performing, uh, internalizing chapter 2, verses 1 through 18, a lot more than what we're hearing tonight. Talk about taking in that living word of God into that impressionable open space, the heart. You can feel his hopefulness. For the Philippians, to not only most definitely realize that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, but that through Christ, his humble obedience, we are indeed free. Free to be freely accountable, responsible servants to his gospel of grace. Grace is an everyday reality, something to rejoice and most importantly, respond to. Returning to that stronghold of a place of empowered faith to fight those battles against the gospel that are either of a tangible or spiritual reality, though leaves us much like Peter in today's uh, Passion Gospel, you know, where he denies Jesus out of fear. He was scared. He was frightened. We are in a quagmire of our own internal battling of what we should do. This is very real for us today. After all, the disciples, we must remember, were for the most part ordinary working class people. Many of them did abandon Jesus during his moment of need. We still do this now to one another, but contrary to the gospel, and hypocritically, as Christians, we justify ourselves and its world over and above that of God's will and precepts of a kingdom of grace here and now for all to rejoice in. If my pulpit doesn't go places beyond this Sunday evening, or beyond your ear canal to your heart for motivation and challenge. What are you planning to be and do for not only Christ's sake, but for the other, the neighbor? We have to begin to fill that waterless pit, that broken vessel with the living word, fount of grace, and put on Christ Jesus as the reason, purpose, goal our lives lived, period. It's not to be the gospel of the world, according to Nicole, Phil, Sharon, um, Pastor Eric, Cheryl, John, Tim, but it is to be Christ Jesus' gospel. It gives us life. 
restores our true purpose and role in the story of creation. We are the sons and daughters of the gospel, for the gospel, to live faithfully, all caps, live faithfully, faith-filled, tearing down, destroying sin in our lives, dying to the world of the self, and busting out of those prison bars of the evil one's bondage upon our will. Peter's three strikes denial in the Passion's Gospel is more like our everyday battle with denying God's grace and precepts for our lives. We have to stop living in denial about who we are and whose we are and freely be prisoners of a hope that is life-giving and rejoice in this hope to bear the fruit of restoration. 